Hello, good evening, and welcome to the LFC Day Trippers Fatback for podcast special. I'm your host, Keith Plunker, and I am delighted to be joined by football historian and author Peter Kenny Jones. And Peter's going to discuss his upcoming book, Little at 100, about the life and times of the great Billy Little. Peter, how are you? Um, I'm still good, thanks very much. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Uh, just to give you all a heads up, me and Pete have had a great chat there for the last while and the uh, show did not record. So we're going to come back in and do it all again. But um, yeah, as I said there, Peter, you've got a book coming out now at in November, isn't it? And it's it's just about Billy Little and any regular listeners to the show know I absolutely love football from a boy gone here. It's football that's not maybe spoken about anymore and not touched upon. And you know, Billy Little is such an important figure in the history of Liverpool Football Club that it's it's great to get this information now. So if you want to give us a bit of um, a bit of input into what the book is about and and what you had to do to to get it to where it is, yeah. So obviously basically a biography of his life so start to finish pretty little um in celebration of what would have been his, his 150 which is coming up in january um obviously calls it a family portrait because i've just tried to speak to as many people as possible really so speaking to family friends teammates supporters and just try to make the full picture of his life you know i didn't want it to be you know just quoting newspaper after newspaper or or whatever just i want it to be the full story of his life but maybe with you know, unheard of stories and just try and look at it a different way rather than just going game by game and just trying to give a different side but just tell the, the full story of his life and why he's so well regarded and, and so well loved at Liverpool. And just so the people know you you're gonna in the in the um compiling of the book you've spoken to was family members of Billy Little and relatives and ex players and you know you got a real feel for Billy Little the man didn't you beyond what you know we may know from from seeing the odd video or seeing reading the odd article you really got a feel for Billy and his life. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the the video that was available is, isn't great. You know, if you look at Shellington from the time, it's the British Pathé and a movie tone, and basically it's just like a 10 second report of the game. You might see getting ahead to a ball that went in, you wouldn't see anything else other than that of a move. So it's hard to get a full idea of what the games were like. But that's why I said, I've tried to speak to as many people as I can. Spoke to you know, his sister, Reno, was a massive help. Spoke to his his twin son spoke to Tom Ogilvy, his cousin. Uh, I've got some you know, sisters in laws and family friends, and then well, obviously a lot of supporters who were really keen to share the story of him. And there was, I think, there's one of the eight, nine ex players he played with, uh, one ex Scotland international. So it's just, yeah, just trying to get, I was trying to speak to as many people as I could. And that was my dad's job, helping me to write all the interviews out. So that was it. I had him. I was paying him in black pudding to write up that, all my interviews. <laughs> that's it, an apprentice. It you had your apprentice. <laughs> that's it, yeah. Um, yeah. That was it. Just try and tell the full story of his life, as I said, and speak to as many people as I could, really. Yeah, excellent. So take us back to, to the start. So, I mean, it's in the title, really, isn't it? Little at 100. So he, Billy was born in 1922. So January. So we're coming up to that 100th 100, 100 birthday. So he's born... Take it away. Where is he born, and yeah, what's so, his early life yeah, like? Yeah, so he's in in, in Dunf, um, Town Hill, in Dunfermline. He's just son of a miner. There was a, a lot of a lot of footballers were at that time, and his mum and dad were just really wanted to make sure they all had a as a as a trade behind them. So you know, obviously Billy's one was was being an accountant, and he was he was really good at school. He, he sounded like one of those kids you date in school. He was good at everything. He was just yeah. good at football, good at rugby, good at athletics, clever. You now passed with flying colours with everything. So I think you know, for for him it was you know it was quite a good childhood. And his mum and dad were were just really sure on making sure they were all set up for life. They didn't want them all all down the mine. So Billy was the oldest, and which led the way really. You know, his brother Tom played for Liverpool as well, and. He, he was looking to be a cobbler as well afterwards. But when his football fell through a bit, he um, he got to go on and have, a, have another pastime. So I think they obviously they were they were caring parents and really tried to map out the, the life of the kids. And you know it was a lot of lads and yeah, there's two twin siblings at the ends, Rita and George. And I say Rita was the one who helped me the most with the book. And yeah, it was just a normal 1920s, 30s childhood really. And, Luckily for, for Billy, he was just really good at football, which which helped take him out of the small town life. 
Yeah, so that's it. I mean, as you say, he's a, he's he's got a talent for football, and he's playing youth football up there, um, locally up, I suppose, around Dunfermline or in in the locality there. And he is brought to the attention of Liverpool scouts by a famous uh, a famous name. Who who was it that spots him or recommends him to Liverpool? Yes, yeah, so we he, he just signed for Liverpool at the time from from Man City. It was uh, Matt Busby, so he was on the golf course with with one of his ex-City teammates and basically just got a tip that City were looking at this lad in, in Dunfermline who was really good. Uh, but they weren't sure they were going to get the deal over the line. Obviously, Liverpool, he was new to Liverpool. He was just trying to maybe try to impress. Obviously, he, was, he came as an experienced player. He tipped off George Kay, the manager, and just said, might be worth going to have a look at him. He sounds quite good. And that's what they did, really. And you know, His, his mum and dad were, were vetting all the clubs that were coming to watch him. I think Partick Thistle and Arsenal put offers in to take him and so did Man City, but they wanted to make sure he had a family home to live in. He had a job lined up and he was going to be guaranteed to be to be playing football. So it was it was a hard deal to make for a, a 16-year-old in Dunfermline, but his, his mum and dad were confident in his ability and they wanted to make sure he, he had a life set up if, if it did go wrong. So you know, they, they looked after him and, and fortunately for Liverpool, they, they're the ones who got his signature. Excellent. So so he moves to Liverpool at 16 years old and it's a big, I suppose, upheaval for, for one so young. But where does where does he end up? How does he how does he get to Liverpool and, and what's his early days like at the club? Yeah, so obviously it was 1938, so it wasn't long before the war began, but obviously they didn't know at the time. He, he was set up with you know, a former Liverpool player, Ned Doig, which I think is how you say it. Um, it he'd, he'd passed away with his widow and, and his son still lived in the clubhouse, so he basically asked if they wouldn't mind you know, Billy coming and living with them and they just look after him. Obviously, that was something, again, that the, the family encouraged because they want him to have like a, a family environment around him. So he was just... A young lad in Liverpool, he was very religious. Went to church, you know. Didn't really was he never drank, never swore, so he wasn't like he was <laughs> going around town with yeah. his top off. Really, and he was just doing his stuff. He was working and playing his football and impressing in the reserves and and in the A team and you know making small headlines, just saying that you know, this this young lad looks like he he could have some talent. And unfortunately for him, and obviously <laughs> the whole world, the war started and and really interrupted his career, but. It looked like he was just on the cusp of getting into the team before it all kicked off. Yeah, so like that, 1938, he's a 16 year old lad. He's, he, as you say, he's, he's about to make it big at Liverpool and the war breaks out. Nobody knows, you know, what, what what's lying ahead there. But um, his football continues during this period, doesn't it? He's, well, it's, it's not, um, it's not recognized, unfortunately, but for Billy. Plows ahead and and has a successful wartime career, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, he was he was definitely part of the team, and it was you know, the first game after the war broke out when you know, the game stopped being official. Yeah. He was he was straight in the Liverpool team, and it was only a friendly against Preston. But then the first wartime game he played, and you know that that first season he he was. Part of the squad, he was he was definitely making appearances. He scored nine and sixteen in, in his first wartime season. You know, that's as a sixteen-year-old, so he was he was a big part of the squad. And I said maybe it did help him a bit. You know, maybe he wasn't fully ready to play first-team football, but it, it gave him that access to it. It got, let him play with the best players that you know, the club had to offer, and he really got to be bedded into it. The West style of play and to go and watch, you know, go and play in front of thousands of people at Anfield and. Get you know, the atmosphere and the players he was playing with. So he, he was definitely part of a squad. And because he was so young, it took him a few years before he was actually sent off to the war. So it probably did help him a little bit, you know, in terms of the war, giving him access to first team football. Yeah, indeed. And uh, wartime football, you know, it, it, there was a lot of moving around and, you know, games here, there, and everywhere, wasn't there? Like, so it would have been a pretty colourful time to be playing. Uh, he wouldn't have been just playing with Liverpool at the time, was he? No, definitely, yes. Yeah. So we travelled around England, um, most notably played for Chelsea quite a few times, um, went up to Scotland, played for Dunfermline, which obviously was you know, his childhood team, and it was it was a big one for the family because it was the first time they could really watch him play like a high level of football. And, you know, all the press and all his family were, were, dead, were dead proud to have him there. 
And then again, he was went to Northern Ireland. He had to turn down Elijah Scott to, because he wanted him to play. He was playing with someone else at the time. And then he went to Canada and played when he wasn't supposed to play. So he had to play under a pseudonym of, of Bill Tanner. And uh, basically, he said, they were like, oh, should play football? And not really. And it went on and scored four in about 10 minutes. So they realised he was he was quite a good player. So I think it, it, even his wife told the story of when he was in training in Warrington, you know, he, he basically broke out of the barracks one night so he could go and play football for Liverpool the next day because he was just he was missing football so much as a young lad. And he just wanted to keep playing wherever he was. So it was... You say it wasn't just for Liverpool, but he, he was definitely as an itch that needed scratching with football, and fortunately he could keep it up while he was while he was fighting the war. Yeah, because he he did he was in the RAF, wasn't he during the war, and he he did actually, um, you know, it wasn't all just playing football and waiting on yeah. the the war to kick off again. Yeah, yeah, so he was a navigator in the RAF, so obviously he wouldn't fly the planes, but would, would, would be alongside them, and you know, people he met then were you know. One of the people he met during the war was his best man, and you know, it, it was it was a pretty important time in his formative years as, as a footballer and as a man, really. And yeah, he was he was definitely involved in the war efforts, and you know, was telling the story that you know, his family made a lot of jokes that he was really bad at navigation and found it ironic that he was given the task of navigating RAF pilots around to go and to go and bomb Germany. But that's that's what his that's what his job was during the war. Well, he knew how to hit the target, I suppose. They were on to say. Hey. So, yeah, um, I like that. I like that. Yeah, you yeah, um, said that last time. I didn't. I was thinking about it. That's why we started again. That's why we started again. Um, but look, the the war is going on. A uh, tumultuous time for everybody, and and nobody knows what's happening. But Billy is out there. He's he's playing football. He breaks his leg in a in one of these games, and. You know, we, we were talking earlier, a leg break now, you have all the modern medicine and you have all the the, the tools to, to get back to 100%. But back then, a leg break, well, players probably play through a lot of injuries. A leg break was a significant, um, possibly a significant setback in his career before he even got going. Yeah, yeah, that definitely. You know, was, you know, so the Dribble C says career, although it didn't end, it definitely took a massive hit by the fact he had the two leg breaks. You know, and talk about however many years earlier, you, know, you could easily end your career with a leg break. So for him to come through that, obviously, it would have been a big scare at the time. And I'm sure he would have been, would have been maybe a, a bit of peace in his mind, the fact that he, he had his accountancy to fall back on. But, you know, he was so football mad, he would, he would have been devastated. So to have that, you know, it was nearly taken away from him. But definitely would have helped spare him on to know that when hopefully the world was back to normal, he could go and make sure he made something in football and you know didn't waste his talents or lose it. Excellent, yeah. So the war happens, the war comes and goes, and eventually games are recognized again and records are being recognized. So Billy comes into the team in um 45, is it or 46, 46 in the FA Cup. 45 46 season FA Cup game yeah. uh comes in um but you were saying something interesting there was still wartime games sort of going yeah. on around then as well and it was yeah, obviously uh, sorry go on. it's just no, obviously because the, the the war ended in in the September so obviously the the traditional season started in the August and they never said you know well we'll just rush the season through and, and change the fixtures they basically just said right well you can have the rest of the year as still wartime while we try and get everything sorted, but the FA Cup will will count. So it was you know they were playing FA Cup games that apparently mattered more than the, the two wartime friendlies that were either side of it. You know it wasn't they weren't just friendlies; they were in leagues and they had the cup at the end of every season. It wasn't yeah. just for nothing. That was probably the the most meaningful, meaningless season that they had. But the FA Cup yeah. was the only thing that that mattered. So it wasn't until forty six, forty seven that the you know, the first division came back. Indeed, so he's he comes into the team and he's a, a left winger. And you know, football now and football then it's a totally different kettle of fish. So Billy's playing as a, as a winger back then, but the formation it would have been the wide of a front five nearly, wouldn't it? And then ahead of maybe a back five. So it, it was the, the formations that people played were were very different. But Billy was a winger predominantly in his early years before moving maybe more centrally. And we're going to talk about um is is goal scoring prowess and how you know it could and should have been better than it is now. So for a wide player at the time like Billy's um 
we can talk about his, his, his numbers at the end. So I have it out down that he made... 534 appearances and got 228 goals, which places him, um, I don't know, sixth or fifth or something in the all time goal scoring charts. But he's actually, it's a disservice to him, isn't it? Because the, the war yeah. point, yeah, yeah, what did you say? Because I tried to add it on the book, obviously, he was, I think, he's sixth at the moment, so he would have been fourth top goal scorer and he would have been his second top appearance, or the way around, but I got it in there. Yeah. But basically, you know, just him and all of his peers, you know, that. A lot of their career was robbed, and and for him to to be as high up as he is and be one of the players you know, in that list, obviously, you know the people he's up amongst, you know, it's the not all of them had wartime effect in their career. Obviously, he was mm. probably the, the one with the most of his career taken off him. So again, it just shows the the impact he had on the club at the time. And I think even even when you look at you know, his first his first season, he played forty games, so he scored eight goals. It wasn't. He really grew into being the goal scorer that, that he, he went on to be. I think the fact that he, he developed his game changed so much and it was just a totally different style of play, as you say, the five up front. And I've tried to explain. I think, you know, for me, I can try and call myself the football historian. I am. Um, I didn't fully understand the formation, so I tried to like lay it out visually so you can see like what it actually means. So you know, being outside left and number 11, as you say, it was like, basically playing Andy Robertson's position but without having to track back that was basically what he was so to do that and score so many goals you know how many did Trent and Robbo score he don't score many so to, yeah. for him to be able to have that involvement and I mean, cut inside he could shoot even fourth he was scoring with his head then also later on in his life as you say he moved more centrally because you know he had such a good eye for goal so I think you know, his ability out wide is, is it's ridiculous you know you say what Salah's like now, he's a winger up amongst all them, but you know, that's what Billy was, and you know, he just he just deserves a lot of respect for how many goals he scored. Indeed, indeed. So I mean, back then in the 1950s and sort of post-war in the English game, you had sort of the the superstars of the time are your Stanley Matthews and Tom Finney's and all these guys, and they were uh, the trickier type of winger, but you know, the Stanley Matthews it, it beat three men and then get his cross away whereas Billy was all pace power and directness wasn't he and and that was um just down to his hard work and all. he was just a different type of player wasn't he he was different to the other great players of the time yeah well definitely all played in similar positions but did it their own way and obviously though there's no right or wrong way and obviously Stanley Matthews the unbelievable player and I think obviously for Billy to be up alongside and just shows how important he was. I think, you know, he is overlooked a bit because maybe because he played for Liverpool. So you look at Tom Finney and Stanley Matthews and the, the clubs they were at, you know, they, they can't be anyone higher than him because Billy's played at a club where we've had Kenny Douglas and Stephen Gerrard. It, he can be overlooked a little bit, but, you know, he, he was up there with, with the world's best and for him to, to you know, to be, to be mentioned alongside those and it was only him and Stanley Matthews who played for Great Britain more than once for him to, be amongst them just just shows how good he was and his goal scoring records and everything. So I think the style of play of him was just he didn't know what he could do. He was fast. He could beat you. He he'd take it round you. He could have a shot from every one to that he beat you in the air. So you just he didn't know what to do against him. So I think obviously that's why he was so effective out wide. Indeed, and another thing I read about him, like he'd never been booked or sent off in his career, but I don't think that was a, a big thing back then. And anyway, but people that played against him would always have said, you know, he was very hard, but very fair. And that, you know, in the, in an era when um, players were probably, you know, a lot more rough play than what, what happens now, you know, he, he was he was very well regarded by his peers. And when you think about it, like he breaks into the team, as we said, his debut one season and he really pushes in the following year and he win the league, Liverpool win the league, but it's the only silverware that he wins at Liverpool and it's at the beginning of his career. Do you think maybe the the, the lack of success of the team maybe hinders Billy's reputation outside of, of Liverpool? Well, yeah, definitely. You, know, it's, you, know, you say when someone sticks to a team through thick and thin, and it literally was no thinner point in, in Liverpool's history than, than when Billy was there and they were coming 11th in the second division. But... The team he came into was you no, know, it was a good blend because obviously it was it was hard to do transfers while the wars going on. So when he came back, they had a lot of experienced players who had been there for a long time, and they had a lot of players who were 
at the peak of the career when the war started, they were now aging, and then young players like Billy were coming into it their early twenties, and for them to that they wanted to hit the ground running and they had the ability to do so. So it was it was a good blend of players at the start, which I think maybe they just didn't replace the experience as the years years passed on, which is my why maybe the four weren't as good as they were. But obviously the forty six, forty seven season it's unbelievable. You know, there's a chapter on it in the book, but the the way that season ends was just it's like it makes the Aguero moment look like nothing. You know, the season was a joke. Like the last few games it was everywhere and they found out they won it. The wild Liverpool were playing Everton in the Lancashire Cup final, so there was a brow full of people, and because there was no TV or anything to watch it, that was the best place to listen to it. And they were changing the scoreboard, and then when when they found out that Sheffield United had, had got the result that they needed for them, there was hats getting thrown and everything. So it's a different style of football, but it though know, it's still the drama was there, and you know, he was that team was a successful one, and you know they had Phil Taylor, who was a great captain, Jack Barmer, who was. He was really pivotal in the end of that season, and Albert Stubbins, who was the record signing. Which I know another interesting fact was that that was the record signing was broke in his first season, we forty six, forty seven, and that transfer fee wasn't broken until his last ever season, sixty one. So it shows the boards just yeah. basically were right behind him at the start, and then they just, as Shankly said, they were like gamblers on a losing streak. They just were too scared to make any changes. So I think the way that the club was was getting run, it was just getting worse and worse and unfortunately for Billy, you know, all the success on and only one trophy and then the FA Cup final in 1950, all the success was really at the start of his career. Yeah, indeed. And he goes through um the nineteen fifties and you know Liverpool get relegated in I keep getting this fifty five as it they go down um yeah. to the second division and Billy is then, you know, he, he's not. It's not that it's unfair to say he's a one man band at that stage, but the the over reliance on on Billy was was huge. And and we were speaking earlier, comparing it to another Liverpool great, um, Stephen Gerrard, maybe Jordan periods when expectation was just heaped on him. And if you know Billy didn't do it the way Stevie didn't do it, Stephen Gerrard won an awful lot of you know the the comparison. I'm just talking about the expectation, you know grabbing a boy to scruff, playing in teams that probably weren't up to his level. And Billy just kept going and kept going. But they, they went down, there was managerial changes happening and, you know, a lot of change in to and from. But Billy was the constant throughout the 1950s, wasn't he? He was, he was consistent and he was hitting goals and he was he was always the shining light. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, it's, I think it is a good comparison with Gerard. Obviously, it's, it's easy to say because it's more recent. But, you know, Billy had offers to go and, and take the mega books wherever he, he wanted to go. Colombia separated yeah. themselves from FIFA and, and just said, you know, they, they were happy for him to pay him a blank check, basically, but he wanted to stay where he was. Aston Villa tried the, to the take weekly him. wage, wasn't it? Sorry for going across it. Yeah, the, the weekly wage was like 12 quid or something at the time. Yeah, so, and yeah, Colombia so went up to 20 at the end. Yeah, but they, they yeah. were just paying whatever, yeah. They that they took like Alfredo Di Stefano and all went um, to play there at Millionaires, I think, in Colombia, and they, they just took the cream of the crop and and it was outside of FIFA and caused all sorts. But Billy resisted, yeah, the the urge to go over there. Yeah, well, I think obviously it was. I think it was probably the the, the biggest discussion he had, and what he probably said, "Should I go? No," because everything else he would even ask, "Should I go?" He just was ten every single way, but. I think he just for him it was the fact that you know Liverpool had been so good to him and the fact you no know, they they gave him that that job as he was as a sixteen year old they gave him the house, one of the first clubhouses that they bought was because they realised you know basically Liverpool wasn't as fashionable or as attractive as London was for a lot of players around the country so they they started trying to buy clubhouses and rather than just trying to entice people in they they made sure they gave Billy one the first one so. I think he appreciated what the club had done to him. And then you say the leg break at the start. He'd fought a war. He'd not long met his wife, who was from Liverpool. I think it all adds together. And, you know, it wasn't just a pursuit of silverware for him. You know, he, he realised that the club had been good to him. And <laughs> what a lot of players aren't like today, he realised that he probably should be nice back to them. So, yeah. obviously, it, it helps that the wage meant he couldn't earn any more anymore, anywhere else. But... Yeah. He still has offers to go and play top level football, and he, he wanted to stay at Liverpool. He wanted to be the one to drag them out of the second division. Yeah, and another thing you you touched on earlier was that his father passed away. I think in early in his Liverpool career, was it nineteen fifty one or something? His father passed yeah. away, and he 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 brought his family down, and it was like he wanted to 
lay roots in Liverpool. You know, we, I suppose the, the city meant a lot to him, even at that sort of early age. But yeah. he pushes through and, you know, he's, he's in a team. And for the book, um, would you have spoke to many of his teammates at the time? Like, would you have uh, had, had some um, contact with some of the people that he played with? Yeah, so obviously, I know it's, it's unfortunate a lot of the people I tried to speak to I've, I've even passed away since I've written it, Tommy Leishman and, and Roger Hunter recently. So obviously it was it was sad. I think I looked at it, I haven't got the exact number, but I think there was like 95 players or 120 players, something like that. But it, I get it was a surprisingly small amount for how many years he played yeah. with, but that's how many players he played with for Liverpool and only nine of them were alive at the time. So you know, it really is a, a period that's on the brink of extinction. It's... I felt like an honour really just to speak to some of the people because I think one of them was, was Alex South who I spoke to and he only played, I think he played like four games for Liverpool but you know, his stories he had was, was unbelievable and you know, you, you look at the stats of these people and you disregard them but you, you realise the stories they've got because they spent years playing with, with Billy and I was lucky enough to speak to the list here, Gordon Wallace, Gordon Milne, Johnny Morrissey, Jimmy Melia, Keith Burke and Shaw, George Scott and, and Alan Banks and they all had a different insight into what he was like and what the team was like. A lot of them were, obviously, because of how long it's been since he played, a lot of them were younger players coming in towards the end of his career. But, again, they just commented on the respect he had and how much you know, Bill Shankly really looked to him at the end. And you know, another great one who I spoke to was Ian Callaghan, who's, who's done a four-way for me. And he was the man who, who basically took his shirt, you know, grew up watching him on the cop to then go and basically go wear the number 11 and, and try and do what Billy did. And, obviously... He ended up breaking his appearance record, so it was it's, it was a good you know, passing of the flame. And then got to speak to Alan Hansen, who showed what it was like when he was a fan. You know, while, while Billy was watching every week, and he tried to get the players advice. And then Jamie Carragher, who, was, who also helped him, basically showed how his legacy lived on through through Ronnie Moran and the ways you know they, they were trying to you know the fact that Billy was up there with you know Doug Leash, Sunez, all, all the biggest names, and you know Rush. He, he'd always be up there amongst them because Ronnie Moran had played with them as well. So it shows how highly thought of he was even long after he passed away. Yeah, because he came, they done that 100 players who shook the cup and he, he came sixth in that. And, you know, when you think of the the players that have come through Liverpool, you know, to for a poll to be done in the modern age, to have Billy still up there in the top 10, it, it's a wonderful achievement and a recognition of, of a hero of a bygone era. But we touched on the fact there that Liverpool got relegated in 55 and they, you know, the, the silverware wasn't happening for Billy, unfortunately, at the time. Um, but there was a sliding doors moment in uh, the 55-56 season where, you know, it, it possibly one of his most famous moments um, in a red short happened. Do you want to to, to take that away, it's a, a, a fifth round FA Cup replay against Man City. Yes, well, I think obviously we're speaking to people. A lot of them that I'd always just say, like, what's the main thing that comes to your mind when you think of Billy? And a lot of them was you know, the fact that he was called Liverpool, the fact that he was oh, him and only Stanley Matthews a play for Great Britain twice, and then this this, this game and the, the non goal. Obviously, City had just gone two one up, literally seconds left on the clock, and. Basically, they took the kick off. Billy just on a one man mission took it past a couple of players 30, 40 yards out, just hit an absolute rocket, flew in the back of the net. The referee's whistle go and, and Anfield's a pandemonium, and all the players are running off. Looks like you know it's, it's about to be extra time. And then they had to put over the tannoy, the, you know, the referee had blown up for full time before it hit the back of the net, and it basically just blew up into like it was just. A joke really all the fans were kicking off and then the next day the echo ran a picture with the referee's hands up after the ball at the back of the net and they were saying oh he'd blown up afterwards from the counters and i was saying you, know, you can just imagine what what social media and what, and what it would be like now with you know, how much of a joke it was you know how much people stood about like lewis garcia's goal and that it, it would in the same type of thing either watch that back and so you know what a joke but it what yeah. really was a pivotal moment because you know we that was what Billy was all about. He was taking his team by the scruff of the neck, and he was he was taking he was on his way to taking them to the next round, or at least taking them to extra time. And I should say, well, what what happened with Bear Trap later that year shows how important Billy was, and how much both their lives would have been different if the referee had waited about half a second more before he blew his whistle. 
which is quite interesting if people don't know man city go on to win the fa cup that year and bert troutman who was a was he a pow uh he was a, a nazi soldier or a german soldier yeah. in the war and he was a pow and he's playing in goal he wins the football writers player of the year that year just before the fa cup final and has a collision against Birmingham and breaks certainly uh, three or four vertebrae in his neck. I don't know if that's class as a full neck break, but he breaks his neck in the game, plays on, gets man of the match. And it so nearly wouldn't have happened. You know, Bear Troutman is famous for that. Now, I know he plays on afterwards and um, I'm sure he, he's... He wouldn't have liked in the neck break, but um, it could have been so different for Billy if they they go through that could have been an FA Cup win which the FA Cup then is a different kettle of fish than what it is now it's it's much more beloved and much more highly regarded back then than um than it, than it is now and Liverpool hadn't won it even at that stage so yeah. he, he was maybe robbed of a of a big moment yeah I would definitely say that how important the cup was at the time and obviously I think they reached the final in 1914 and then obviously Billy was part of the 1950 FA Cup final and obviously mm. it was a massive blow because they'd beaten um, Arsenal home and away that yeah. season and, and obviously they, I think when they got to the, when they reached the final they were top of the league by a few points and obviously going to the FA Cup final the season just completely fell apart and they finished outside the top four and they lost the final it just all went wrong and they would have been the first post-war team to win the double had they, um, had they done that so it was it really was a massive one, and obviously to have that moment again, and they knew they had FA Cup prowess. I mean, they had some massive games against Everton, and they were always the big. They got the crowds going, so they knew how important the FA Cup was. And as you say, just to, to have that moment robbed from him and and from the fans, it was it was really controversial at the time. Yeah, a tough one to take, and I think he took over the captaincy then as well. Did he? he became the Liverpool captain in his latter years as well. Um, yeah, from Lord Hughes, so I could be wrong. Um, we thought I read yeah. that huge. Yeah, I think it was. It was. It was. It was a bit of a tough one because it, it changed quite a lot in that period. It was never like a really official time that he had it, and he, um, you're right there. Yeah, so I thought whacking the knee <laughs> off the table. <laughs> Sorry, don't worry. Um, so yeah, he was. Yeah, he, he had the captain's arm, man, but it wasn't for too long. But I think, you know, he was. He led by example. He wasn't someone who, who would ever shout a ball at someone. So I think maybe when your team's in the second division and, and struggling a bit, I think maybe you needed someone who was going to put a rocket up someone. So I think that's maybe why he didn't hold it for so long. But the respect he had amongst the players, which was why he was awarded, you know, the armband. So obviously didn't really wear it, but the armband at that time. And it was a, a period, as we touched on earlier on, on, on the Ghost show, was, you know, the second <laughs> division back then. So he, he spent the second half of the, the 1950s up till the, the end of his Liverpool career playing in the second division. Um, it's it's unfair, it's a shame maybe that he wasn't playing first division football and maybe it does sort of shadow his legacy a bit, you know, in, in the wider game. But the second division, it was a tough league to, to play in as the championship is now but you know there was even though he was doing his business in the second division it was still being noticed and would still be you know it's it's not that it's devalued he was still there doing scoring goals and making all these appearances and it, it just never really happened for him he was part of an era then before i think bill shankley comes in in 1959 correct me if i'm wrong yeah, 59, that's right. shankley yeah. comes in and at that stage, Billy is he must be near 40 at that stage, is he? Or it's certainly in his late 40s. Yeah, it was he was 13 when he retired, and that was in, in 61. So yeah, he'd have been yeah, late 30s, mid late 30s. And yeah. And a lot of miles in his legs, you know, he's playing a long time and a lot of a lot of um hard yards in those legs of his, those tree trunk legs. Um but He's he's moved more centrally, really, isn't he? At the when the pace starts to decline, he's he's more the brain is more um what he's playing off, and he's Bill Shankly highly regarded Billy, but he was at the end of his career. But he, it's a new dawn coming in at Liverpool, and you touched on the fact that it's Ian Callaghan that replaces him uh, in the team, and 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 is, you know, I was reading that in one of his last games, he's substitute for Roger Hunt, you know, and it's all these illustrious names, Jimmy Mealy, as you touched on, you know, these players that are bringing us into the nineteen sixties, and it was just the end of one era before the dawn of a successful era, and it's something that we don't, 
you know, there's an era of football now that's on the verge of being forgotten, isn't there? Yeah, it would, definitely. I think, you know, a lot of people think, you know, as you said before, football began in 92, and a lot of, a lot yeah. of poor fans think it began in, in 1959 when, when Shankly came, but it wasn't. You know, there was, there was a lot of football before it. I think, you know, Phil Taylor was the man who ultimately took Billy out of the team, and it was in 58, and it was the first time in 20 years that Billy had ever been dropped. He'd obviously yeah. he'd been injured or whatever, but he'd literally not missed a game. From 1913, from the war start into 1958, so they, they put the house and the, the fans were gutted because you know he was still he was still doing it. He wasn't a bad player, and uh, Phil Taylor tried to put him back out wide and was played him in the reserves as, as a winger. But he, the, the fans wanted him back at the number nine because they knew I think it was Alan Arnell was playing at the, at the time. And they were just said he, he wasn't as good as what Billy was, but phil taylor was trying to make him back into a winger which is you know whether it was the right decision for the 36 year old but he was he, he was just still so loved by the fans and i think when shankley came in i think he played about one or two games to start of the season under phil taylor and then when shankley came in i think he played 11 of the last 14 or something mad like that so he was shankley realized that he, he although he had lost a lot of his pace and you know, maybe he definitely wasn't the player he was i think for for Shankly, it was important to have someone that you know knew how Shankly wanted to play because he played with him at Scotland and he both played together wartime football at Liverpool. So I think it was important for him to have that leader in terms of example and the football he wanted to play. And basically, Billy was replaced by Ian St. John, who was coming a couple of years later, and, and yeah. Roger Hunt. So, as you say, it was it was a massive change over that time. And Billy was just really a really really unlucky player because. If he was born ten years later, he'd have been part of you know that first FA Cup win, and if he was born twenty years later, he'd have been dominating Europe. So he, he was born hundred years later, he'd be worth millions of pounds. So he's just really unlucky on the time he was born, but he definitely made the most of it with you know, his ability and the, the amount the crowd loved him. Indeed, indeed, and again, you know, he had a, a, a international career with Scotland. Um, we have a twenty nine Scotland caps, eight goals, and that doesn't seem like very much when you think of today's standards, where players are regularly hitting a hundred caps and and this. But back then, it was a different time, wasn't it? Yeah, so they'd only play about three, four a season, really. That you know they wouldn't be travelling around the world, and they might have in the summer a little tour where they'd go and play another two or three games, but it was all just the home nations really throughout the season, which obviously meant that particularly the Scotland England games were huge at the time. Yeah. And obviously when he went to Hamden it was it was a massive atmosphere and he did have little tours around Europe, which you know there was a, a few good stories from them because I managed to speak to to Doug Cowie, who was one of his teammates and he was he was a big help to saying what it was like. But you know he had a good amount of caps for the Scotland player at that time and he was robbed because the Scottish FA were just the shambles, really. They only they were ran by the people who the directors of, of Celtic and Rangers and a couple of other clubs. So they just wanted to pick their own players and then they wouldn't let the manager pick the team. They just wanted to pick like four players each. Yeah. They only took 13 players out of a possible 22 to the World Cup. They turned down a World Cup opportunity because they didn't think that the team should qualify because they lost to England in, in the qualifiers. So it was just it just made no sense that what they were doing really and billy was definitely good enough to be part of that team so i think he was robbed of a lot more caps robbed of not being able to say played in the world cup but for the impact he had for a, a a player a scottish player playing in the second division of english football to be able to get that many appearances and great britain that we touched on before i think yeah. it just shows how good he was internationally not just at club level Indeed, and as we said, then is the the career Peter's out. Um, he he finishes up in sixty one, but he's still a a, f, um, a face around Anfield, and he's you know he's he's in the players' lounge for games, and he's still a big influence, and he, he's a hero to a lot of the next generation of players, isn't he? Like he's the one that they're all looking up to. He was the Kenny Daglish and the Stephen Gerrard of the of his day, and. He was such a big figure. Well, the thing that always comes across about him was he was a humble man and he he lived his life. He played the game the way he lived his life. Like he was, he wasn't fussy. He wasn't flashy. He was just a a, a strong man who who played the game he loved and carried that after his life as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He was obviously 
a big a big part of the club and a big part of his life was, was Liverpool. Obviously, he spent so many years there moving in 1938 and you, you come into 1961. Obviously, it was inevitably be retiring, but he, he never thought about going back to Scotland. So he, he wanted to stay in the city. He worked for Liverpool University and the fans still loved him. It used to be part of the pre-match ritual. They all knew where his seat was in the main stand. He used to come out and they'd all cheer his name and he'd give him a little wave. So like he, he, he was still massive in the club and as you say, a lot of Scottish players coming through. He would never be someone who'd impose himself on them, but he was always happy to listen to them and offer advice if they wanted it. You know, Alan Hansen, when I spoke to him, he, he couldn't have spoke any high, any more highly of him, really, just saying how he was just trying his best to, to make sure they were settling in. Obviously, there wasn't many foreign players in those days, so the Scottish players were the foreigners for the time. Yeah. They, were the, they, they were the most sellers coming from halfway across the world. So for him to be able to offer advice and and speak to them obviously would definitely would have helped them and you know like w- with what happened with with Andy Robbo he was he, he was so happy to be able to meet Kenny at the time for all those Scottish players they'd have grown up watching yeah. pretty little so for, again for them it was even if it was their dad's hero or whatever it was to be able to meet them and speak to him and yeah he, he, he loved the club and unfortunately like what what happened with, with Bill Shankly he, he wanted to be on the board but they, they didn't select him he wanted yeah. to be part of the club and they just didn't really respect him or honour him properly yeah. and he, he deserved a lot more at the time but that was just the way football was you needed a lot of money behind you to be you didn't you didn't really have your honorary directors and stuff like that the after day you needed to have the money to help with the transfers and stuff so yeah. that might yeah. be why a different involved. role yeah a different yeah. role it's not an ambassadorial uh job like it is now for so many players well, Billy goes on and like you said he he passed away um 2001 was it that he passed away yeah um, do you want to touch on that? Yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. So obviously he was, he had, he had to battle with Alzheimer's, and it was something that I'd really tried to touch on the book quite a lot because yeah. obviously he was with what's going on and, and, and Roger Hunt has been you know, similar, and we had a lot of people, you know, Teddy McDermott and Nobby Styles, and you can you can list them all day. It's hard yeah. with how many yeah, was more than so sad of, of how yeah. many people and. I just think there's, there's no accountability really. I know obviously Alan Shearer has done his documentary on BBC and I think it just seems clear to everyone that there's a link, but there doesn't seem to have been like an official apology or anything. You know, the, basically the, the people in charge of football at the time just weren't taking notice of the fact that there was, especially in winter or when it was raining, there was a couple of players a game going down with head injuries, getting bandaged up and they'd be wobbling about and the crowd would be laughing, but you know, there was didn't seem to be any consideration to the welfare. So it's, I tried to pick up on it as much as I could and you don't know, like it, it must be a link between football, but you don't know which, which one it was and what game it was. But if you look at all the examples of every time he's getting a head injury and not just heading the ball because he was, so brave going in with big challenges with keepers and defenders that must be a cause of what it was and it was you know it was in the late 80s he was feeling the effect of it and we had the illness for such a long time and basically he just took a step back from from public life his wife didn't really want people to know mm. so it was just he kind of got forgotten in that period as well because you know people weren't seeing him but I think it, it was really good that in, in 94 and on the last stand of the cop, he got to come out to Anfield. I don't think anyone would have known then he wasn't well, but yeah. you can watch the video on that. It, it's great there because obviously there was no chance, proper chance in those days. It's great that he could go out full house to Anfield and they could sing his name. And I think that meant a lot to the family that he could, he could do that as well. So I think obviously it was a really sad way his life ended and you know he, he died in 2001 but a, a big part of him had died about about 20 years before really yeah. so it was it was sad but it's just indicative of what football was like at that time and unfortunately now we're seeing all these players passing away with, with the same illnesses so it's just yeah, yeah sad it's, it's too common at the moment isn't it as you see it touched on all those great players and and the same thing you know and it's going to get worse unfortunately before it does get better but it's um you know, I'm looking forward to reading the book. I can't wait to to actually read the book because it's it's an area that I love in football. You know, anything that was in black and white, I'm all over. Big fan of it. So I look forward to reading it. So when is the book out? Yeah, so um, 8th of November, the day after my birthday. So it's easy to remember. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's out the first one. It's in all the main places you'd expect to see a book um amazon w.h.m.f waterstones all good book 
stockists or whatever you say. Um, and I've done my own, I've got it on my own website as well, which would be best for me if people want to get it from there. I've got, you can obviously buy the book, I can sign it. And I've done like a few like pre order bundles so you can get a couple of programs with it. I think I've got one here actually. So like, you get little like programs of reproduced them. So like yeah. the clubs have let me do it. I've got like, I think five or six from his career, like the 1950 FA Cup final, his testimonial, some from 46, 47. So I just tried to get that. And then his little brother's autograph book, got that from, again, from the 46, 47 season when he played for Great Britain, Scotland, and for Liverpool. So it's all like the best players at that time. So yeah, it's out on all, all those main places. And if you can get it from my website, that'll be best for me. But if you just buy it, I'm more than happy. Brilliant, and we will lash the details up of the website in the in the show description when it does go out, um, and people can do that. Like support as much as much as you can, but let's let's support Peter the best way we can. Um, but Peter, look, it's been a pleasure having you on with us tonight. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Like I said, it, it's it's a, a a subject that I really love talking about is is football from a, a boy gone here and. This has been one that I've been looking forward to. It took us a while to to get together and do it, but I just want to thank you for your time coming on. Uh, it's longer than longer than we probably expected, but um, <laughs> thanks for giving us that time to talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. Oh no, thank you very much, Trav. I mean, obviously, I just think as you said, it's a period of football that looks like it might be going extinct, and I think he's one of the best players Liverpool have ever had. So hopefully, I can just introduce him to a few new people, and then maybe reignite. The- a little flame with the ones who, who, who do love him and hopefully just his story lives on a bit longer because he deserves that exactly you know it's it's given that bit of um posterity to a legend that that people are sadly you know forgetting about the the legends of, of those areas so look anybody watching get on get the book have a read enjoy it uh enjoy it. the the story of as as pete said one of the greatest ever players to do it for the reds um but look, it'll be great to get it. Good Christmas present as well for anybody. You know, it's it's a, a nice time to be to be hitting that. But before we finish up, if you like the show, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. We'll have all the details of where you can get Peter's book. And yeah, you can see on the screen there is is that your Twitter handle at Peter Kenny Jones. Get That's on me. and follow Peter, and you'll be able to find out any uh, updates or or stuff like that. And look, Pete, it was great having you on. I'd love to get you on again in the future and have another chat. Um, if you are interested in that, that would be excellent. Um, yeah, we could definitely do something along those lines. Um, but for tonight, I'm going to say good night and thank you very much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Good night. No worries. Listen, uh, take care. This has been the Fatback 4. I've been your host, Keith, and this has been our little at 100 special.